Yes, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Philip Stiles from the uh, Judge Business School in Cambridge. Um, he's co-director of the International Centre for HR Development. Um, and it's another friend of BT who worked with us in research for, for a long time and uh, before that other areas across across BT. Uh, so he knows the company well um, and also works a lot with other companies large and small uh, on HR policies, particularly those focused on innovation. Um, and it's been helping uh, us look at pulling together company level views of, of governance, which he will talk about. Um, you know, those designed to speed innovation, but which uh, um, open up new sorts of risks that we need sort of new systems to make sure that we're controlling and understanding. He and his colleagues have looked at uh, several companies that uh, have gone down the path uh, before us a little bit on the, some of these uh, organisation-wide governance systems um, and uh, we're learning from that and also the academic inputs and um, been particularly interested in how we connect this to the uh, highly technological and distributed organisation that, that BT is. So uh, it'll be very interesting. Thank you Philip, over to you. Thanks Amelia, thank you Stephen, it's great to meet you all uh, on the call. Um, in this presentation uh, it really I guess the starting point here would maybe to go back to what Tim Wickley said uh, right at the very beginning, um, which was about the need to look at both technology and organizations to really get a you know a holistic view about how we introduce a technology like NGCDI. And our role in the project <clears throat> has really been to look at some of the organizational issues uh, which are you know looking you know challenging the project and and how we might introduce such a technology. And as Stephen said, we've been working closely with both with BT and with other organizations to try and see how this how this might work. Surprisingly, although risk and governance is a, are, are both fairly um, uh, you know, well researched, lots of volume about them in the journals, um, te te technical risk, technology risk is a very, very emergent field. And governance and technology is almost um, non-existent. So we've been looking at this in a very kind of entrepreneurial way. And what we thought we might try and present to you in this in this presentation, just four things really. One is, of course, to say, you know, what is risk in the context of this project? <clears throat> and of course, also with BT. Secondly, to take a look at what we call the risk at the model level. So I'll explain that in a second. Secondly, the enterprise level, uh, which means the organization as a whole. And last but not least, we'll, te we'll take a look at the issue about risk maturity. Uh, Tim, in his in his presentation, talked about culture, and culture indeed is a big part of of how we manage risk and, of course, governance. Um, and we'll say a few words about that um, at, at the end. So this this presentation was put together by myself, also my colleagues uh, Eleanor and Pradeep are also on the call, and um, they'll also be with you, as as will I, <clears throat> in the afternoon session, just to take uh, some some soundings about the use cases that we we've, we've got for you. Um, in the afternoon. So uh, let me just jump ahead and go to risk. So just to set some context really, um, obviously BT is, is, is well, well versed in, in risk. BT has a, this is from the annual report. Um, I think what's very interesting about this diagram is the, the piece about strategy here. Um, obviously being from a business school, Eleanor, Pradeep, myself from the business school, um, we're very well versed with strategy and the, the need for risk and strategy and culture and governance all to be of one piece. And I think, it's, of course, it's very nice to see that so, so clearly explained in the, in the BT uh, context. I guess our role in the project is just to see how NGCDI can mitigate risk and how it might help us, you know, particularly as complexity and te technical issues um, become more prevalent and more, you know, more complex, just how does NGCDI help us with this? So a few things here, I guess. So just to take us through how we see NGCDI in terms of risk, let me just start with a few definitions briefly. Um, when we think about risk, of course, we, we all have an intuitive sense of what risk might be. Most of us, at least certainly in the business world, think about risk in a sort of fairly negative way. So one definition is that risk is a threat, has a danger or some form of harm. That's a kind of fairly standard view. Um, similarly with governance, governance seems to be a kind of safety net. That's the sort of perception of governance. It's a kind of safety net issue, um, which indeed, of course, it is. And so is risk sometimes, of course, is negative. However, however, um, 
one of the big things about risk and governance is the upside issue, which is about how much opportunity do these things give us? Um, and what will it allow? You know, every organization, as uh, famously Mark Zuckerberg said, every organization um, is involved with risk. And if it's not, then it's going to go out of business. And so risk and opportunity, of course, and governance and opportunity are, are very, very close to it. So that's how we're looking at things. It's not just a kind of compliance issue, although compliance, of course, is very important. Um, why does NG NGCDI help? Because, because, you know, the way we're working right now carries significant risk. Um, there seems to be, you know, if we carry on right now as we are, of course, there's a kind of inflexibility to the system. We've learned from our BT colleagues that if you have to change anything in the system, it's, it's pretty expensive to do that. Um, and that change will be quite disruptive to the network. And also issues can be hard to detect. Um, the introduction of autonomics may help us with this. So it's certainly increased visibility and it probably will increase control. It'll make changes easier, more continuous, cheaper. Um, at the kind of enterprise level at the very least, we can start to use scenario modeling and decision making. And we'll come to some of those techniques in a second. And third, but not least, it provides the opportunity to run things at a business policy level. Um, in, 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 in the design of the, of, the, um, of the system, which will allow us to kind of trial and error and you know, without, without causing any, any major issues with the operational side of the network. Similarly, just to give you still you know, the, the positives of NGCDI, again, change, particularly autonomics and DevOps, is continuous. So we need to understand the dynamics of that. I mentioned, you know, Emergent technology is very little understood in terms of risk and, and um, technology. Um, so how do we manage emergence? How do we control for that? Predict it um, is very important. Um, of course, the issues around protections. Um, we've heard from Idris and from Ajit um, about autonomic and human alerts and mitigations and anomalies and so on, all very, very important. Um, also at the local level, strategic enterprise, in other words, the business unit level, how does that work? How do we integrate that? Um, and of course, how do we see the overarching, the superordinate goals? In other words, risk and governance is an aggregation issue. How do we, how do we make sure we're connected? Again, all these things will come to you in a second. Um, and last but not least, the operations, roles, responsibilities, and governance. The, the connectivity of this um, is, is, a, is an issue. And again, the, the project, the MGCDI approach, promises to help us with. So that's the benefit. Of course, NGCDI is a new technology and has to be introduced and integrated and embedded. That will bring risks itself. Okay, we're not, obviously we're attuned to that too. Um, it's important that we see that NGCDI will bring its own risks as it, all technologies does uh, do. So um, that's also part of our role is to see just where those risks might lie. Just want to say a couple of words about this issue. The, the way we've been looking at this particular issue, we've been looking at a number of organizations in similar fields, net organizations where, where the industry is, is, is networked, it's regulated, it's extensive, diverse. Um, or, you know, I, I suppose you know, industries like financial services, like engineering, like construction, um, uh, logistics, and organizations of this kind, of, of which we'll show you two uh, in the afternoon. Um, what, what these organizations tend to have in common is two broad levels of, 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 um, of risk management. At the top, what we call the enterprise risk. So you can just see on the diagram, I hope, um, you know, just a, a schematic, an illustrative sense of what, what the risk might be it's from strategic risk, environmental risk, reputational risk, technical risk, operational risk. With the operational risk, we tend to see there, that's where the technology piece tends to fall under, not, not, not exclusively, but mostly. So then when we move into the model risk, we're talking really about specific business specific, uh, specific um, applications. Um, and I'll show you again some examples. And indeed, you've heard some examples from my colleagues already. Um, and there we're looking at those specific models, um, the, model, the model data, the model design, the model um, implementation, and of course, the performance. Um, at BT, um, Enterprise risk compliance is, is only at the group level. Um, each business area has its own risk appetite. 
the risk register, the mitigations, you know, so it's a devolved process. Um, but somehow connecting all this up, and we have some exemplars from other industries to show how that might be done. Um, how we might join all this up will be very important. And so that's that's kind of key. All right, good, good. So let's let's have a look at the model level. Let's have a look at the model. Level. So model level means, you know, already you've seen some models um, from my colleagues, from um, you know, from all of my colleagues, in fact, you know, around predictive maintenance, about ORAN, about um, you know. Router upgrades. There are lots of models in NGCDI, and indeed, you know, across BT as a whole, um, we're defining model here as a, in very broad terms. A model is a system, a quantitative method or an approach that relies on assumptions in economic, statistical, mathematical, and uh, technologies. So it's a very broad definition of model. Um, in terms of risk, in terms of NGCDI, what we're trying to work on, of course, is how do we make smarter decisions of smart operations. How do we make these models more you know, accurate and um, you know, safe for us to use? That's, that's what we're thinking about in terms of model risk. So the project level, the model level, what, what are some of the kind of issues that are being brought up? So when we've, we've conducted a lot of research, um, particularly kind of qualitative research into how risk managers governance individuals, um, system developers, uh, and so on, you know, think about these kinds of things. Um, and we've spoken to organizations and we've spoken to regulators, we've spoken to lots of different people about this. And in a way, there's, 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 a, kind of, there's a kind of common set of issues across models. One is you know, the, the model data itself. And just to give an illustrative set of questions, um, first of all, what is the data quality? That's just one question. We have an extensive list, but just to give you an illustrative sense. In other words, if we're going to start thinking about what kind of model we're using, are we, is, the, is the data good enough? Secondly, what about the design of the model? Have we got the right parameters in place, for example? One obvious question. Third issue is about the implementation. So how do we assess this? You know, how do we know the, um, the system is operating as we should, uh, as it should? And last but not least, of course, about the performance of the model. And this is really, of course, as it sounds, you know, about is, is the model doing what it should be doing? Can we trust it? Is it valid? And so on. And those sets of issues too. Okay, so this is a kind of generic sense of how model, um, model risk is, tends to be compartmentalized. Just beneath that, in a sense, if you look at the first two boxes, we're thinking here about the setup risk. Setup risk. In other words, before the, before the model is introduced, are we, are we happy with, with how it's been designed, with the data it's been used on? Are we all okay with that? Um, and here, I guess, what we're looking at is um, you know, just, you know, first of all, the model in itself, is the model within itself good enough? Secondly, what about the interdependencies of this model with other models in that universe? So that's one thing. So the setup risk is one thing. The second piece is about the operational risk. So once the model is up and running, how do we ensure that it's running accurately? And this, again, this is where you know, the discussions we've had so far from Idris, Najit, and others about controls, parameters, warnings, alarms, all those issues come into play. Um, with the broad piece with the interdependencies, one of the things we'll talk about a little bit in our, in our use cases uh, later on this afternoon um, is the use of digital twins, um, scenario modeling, what, if, what ifs, and so on. Those kind of big picture pieces. We'll come to that in, in a second here too. Okay. So remember, we're still talking about the model risk issue. Um, so this is a diagram that's been familiar to, to colleagues within the project for some time. Um, and the kind of headline of this, pro this, this model is about from, you know, from automation to autonomous. So you see some pictures on the right, people and machines. And in a sense, you know, in traditional automation, um, 
you know, we're trying to, you know, move down. So from creation at the top, so in a sense, that's the, the design issue, the intense issue. You know, what does the customer want? How can we design around that, around their intent? How can we get the SLAs? How can we get the assurance and all those kinds of things? And then moving to the blue boxes, which is about the, you know, the, the you know, making sure those intents fit into the, into the system and then that system is automated and then, you know, then the automation happens. And then the light blue boxes is about the kind of human interpretation of this and the control of this. And what NGCDI promises is really, again, I won't go through all that, but what it promises is that we can extend this sense of automation all the way through this process. Okay? As Tim said and others said, um, that doesn't mean humans will be out of the loop, but it does mean that some of the learning and the adaptation will be controlled by the machines um, or by the algorithm and so on, by the system which should help us to create a, you know, a stronger, more flexible, um, you know, greater capacity network, um, which can scale much, much more easily. So that's that piece, that's why NGCDI is really important because it allows us to do some of those things. And Nick, Nick mentioned at the beginning, you know, the issue about autonomic management. And of course, that's a, a, you know, a core part of this entire project. Um, and again, just to, again, we're still in the model risk area for now. Again, when we're thinking about the model risk, with the autonomic system and the structure of that, um, this is a kind of fairly, you know, a kind of just a, a, a schematic here where we have at the top, we have the automatic, as we said, the, 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 auto, the automatic working. Um, and I guess here, what we have, which goes down, say, to an adaptive or self-learning level, which goes down to a second loop level, meaning, so from automatic, which we know, which is, you know, the kind of millions of actions that happen each day in a system, which you often don't need to think about because um, all the system is running well, unless there may be anom anomalies or alarms come up. The adaptive level is obviously the more dynamic, self-learning level. Um, and again, important to know how the machine is, 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 is feeding on itself and how it's learning from itself. And indeed, when, when does a human need to get involved in that process? The third level is the second loop level. In other words, how do we see the whole system from above and judge whether the system is actually working for us and helping the strategy and helping the intents. And so when we think about autonomic management like this, you start to think about some of the risk issues on the, on the right-hand side. So at the automatic level, we think about, of course, we think about risk assessments. We have the, sort of a, a tool support issue. Um, we have the, you know, the anomaly detection issues, the recommenders. For the adaptive set sense, we have, you know, again, we're looking at the dynamic part of this. And again, dynamic analyses and risk models will really help here. And the last thing, which is about the overarching view of this, of this whole process. In other words, is this still fitting the business intent and strategy and so on, and the finances, of course, and all the rest of it. This is sometimes where the digital twins come in really useful. It's also, the scenario planning comes in very useful. Again, just a, a caveat here. You know, these, 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 um, these processes, again, carry their own risk. For example, Digital Twin carries its own risk that are we representing reality accurately and so on. We know that, but these are some of the things that we need to, we need to consider. Okay, so at the model level, these are some of the things we have to, to consider. You know, the nature of autonomic working, um, the various levels involved, um, the the degree to which we allow machines versus humans to interact and to, to control. Um, and then what kind of levels do we, do we allow in terms of seeing the whole system, plus also at the micro level at the model, um, what kind of alarms, anomalies, et cetera, do we use? And what, what, how, do we, how do we calibrate those? 
So let's just take a look at the enterprise level. So enterprise level tends to be called enterprise risk management. Again, BT is, is very well versed in this, of course, and we have great, great materials on this. Um, and, you know, and the definition of enterprise risk is really just a process, you know, really look at the, you know, the board, the management, the whole organization, um, the kind of aggregate sense of risk across the entire organization. And again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this can be very extensive, you know, strategy risk, you know, reputation risk, technical risk, of course, and all, all this you know, right the way across BT. Right the way across. So it's a huge, huge um, undertaking, uh, very important, of course. Let me give you a sense of, um, of this. Uh, so this is really, um, uh, just a schematic. So when you start to look at how organizations work, particularly in terms of their of their governance structure, it, in a large organization, this tends to get quite complex quite quickly. So in an organization the size and complexity of BT, you see something similar to this, but this is this is from a financial services um, uh, model. So at the top you have the board of directors, of course. Um, and then to the left of that, you have the board risk committee, usually comprised of non-executive directors. Below the board, you have the executive committee, which is, of course, the executive directors. Um, and they're informed by the risk and management committee. Again, for, again executive um, individuals. Those, these, these bodies now are thinking about, of course, about strategy and business intent. So just to go down that middle set of boxes. So in other words, the board and the executive committee, usually the executive committee at the beginning, um, they determine what the strategy is for the organization. They also determine what the financial issues are, um, the control issues are, uh, the risk appetite, etc. All those things. Are controlled. Yeah, there's a there's a kind of overarching framework for all this. Once those things are set, of course it's dynamic. But just to give you the conceptual uh, uh, structure for this, then of course you have risk management to make sure that actually all the all the activity going on to deliver the strategy is safe and compliant and and you know and works and works. On the right hand side you have the policies. So again, you know, if we're going to take new opportunities, if we're going to if we're going to take uh, if we're going to merge, or we're going to create a new business, or we're going to divest a business, or we're going to you know move to a different country, what kind of policies are in place? Similarly, how do we deal with customers? What kind of policies are in place to deal with customers? Just to go back to the intent issue. How do we deal with customers? You know, what terms do we use? How do we set our SLAs and so on? So below that, we get to what we call the control framework, which is the whole raft of controls across an organization. You know, everything from compliance, risk, monitoring, KPIs, everything, everything. Um, and here you'll see a, you know, a range of things like dashboards and what ifs and scenario planning and all sorts. And you'll see that also at each individual level. So in other words, the board, board of directors will have, you know, they'll have, they'll have a dashboard. That, you know, so when they run a board meeting, they can see the, you know, the red, amber, green, and they can just check off, you know, what's going well, what isn't going well, probably on a on a management by exception basis. And the executive executive committee will have a more detailed scenario or the more detailed dashboard. Again, not just. You know, reacting in the moment, but predictive. You hope, one hopes, certainly in the financial services, it's predictive. On the right-hand side, you've got something called internal audit, and the reason that that's there is because that's called the third line of defense. So, in most models of risk, you have three lines of defense. The first line is the front line. In other words, the business owners or the business managers, they must own the risk at the at the local level. Second line. It's really about committees and um, sometimes compliance and risk management. 
in other words, check, you know, checking that, checking out the performance of the front line, making sure it's still on track. Third line is internal audit. There is a fourth line, according to the literature, very, very nascent on this, which is, of course, about the external regulator. Okay, so just to give you that and give you maybe a quick example, um, here's Barclays. So Barclays, we'll, we'll talk about more um, in the afternoon session with my colleagues, Paddy um, and Eleanor. Again, I won't go through that, but you can see that's the kind of, that's the kind of approach. There's lots of interaction, lots of humans in the loop here. <laughs> um, that's important because, especially when we come to risk maturity, that's very, very important. How, how clued up, how, how wise are people throughout the organization, um, through the levels, through the levels. If you remember in 2008, the financial crash, um, that's where risk management really took off in the financial services industry. A little bit late, you might argue, but um, ever since then, financial uh, risk and governance and financial services have been probably the best, certain sector-wide um, that there is. And uh, of course, things still get through and so on, but nevertheless, the thinking here is very, very strong. Um, and some of the um, some of the lessons from financial services can be can be uh, can be tracked over to 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 other organisations in other sectors. So we'll talk more about Barclays um, in the use case uh, after lunch. The last thing I want to say really is um, about how do we integrate this in the risk maturity issue. So let me just show you this. It's a bit. Busy, but um, I hope you can kind of understand it. I hope we're trying to slowly build this diagram to this point. So risk maturity um, tends to be a kind of index of how does a firm deal with all the aggregated risks across the operation? Yes. And indeed, how well trained and knowledgeable are people within that, op that operation to deal with risks and to understand them and to collaborate about them. So the bottom, the blue boxes are the ones we showed earlier about the levels of autonomic working. So we try to build that picture, if you like. So when we're dealing with the model issue, we're dealing with discrete risks within that particular model about, its, about the data, the design, the implementation, the performance of that. And that'll be happening across that model and this model in a hundred, maybe maybe more than a hundred, maybe a thousand. In the case of a financial services organization, thousands of models. Above that, above that, there will be a model risk committee which will validate that process or not, or not, depending on how good the model represents reality and how well the data has been used and what kind of data it has and so on. Once it gets through that, then it goes up to an aggregate level. In other words, how well does that model fit in with all the other models that are going on in that same? How do we, how do you make sure that happens? How do you make sure that's safe? And then once that's okay, then we go up and we think about the superstructure, yes? In other words, the enterprise risk. How does it fit into the enterprise as a whole? And how do we link the information that we're getting from these models up into the risk management, to the risk committees, to the executive committee, to the board? And of course, it's an iterative process. It doesn't tend to start in one place. It tends to kind of go around. The people on the right-hand side are very, just illustrative people, meaning we need people at all levels to be acquainted and knowledgeable and collaborative about all these things. And just to give you kind of six quick, you know, personae, at the very top, we have the board of directors. If you look at the literature on boards of directors, I'm not saying this for BT, I'm just a general literature. Um, in most organizations which are highly regulated, and technically complex, um, we tend to get a good sense of, of, of the board being very engaged with risk and governance. 
which is, you know, of course, is exactly what you want. I mean, it's not always the case, but that's exactly what you want. And there's a big, of course, big arguments about whether you have chief risk officers and, and so on. In fact, um, there's a counter argument saying if you have um, too many risk officers and too many risk committees, um, what that tends to do is that board members, executive directors, etc., tend to push responsibility and indeed awareness onto the risk people away from themselves, which isn't ideal, as you can imagine. So there's some nice research to suggest that actually if, if there are too many risk people in the mix, um, i.e. risk professionals in the mix, um, too many, I mean, they're essential, of course, but too many, or, or if the executives or the, or the managers push responsibility onto them, those organizations become more risky uh, in a negative way. Um, so, with, so these there are several things like this which we which we can touch on maybe later. Um, of course, you have the kind of customer engagement issue. Remember Stephen's diagram, looking at those different aspects, those different people. You know, the, the customer, the customer people, the operations people. Similar issue here. So, you know, how do we get? How do we make sure the intents are being delivered well enough? How do we make sure that the negotiation with customers about their intents is good enough? Um, and so on. Third level, I guess, is really about um, the aggregate. Who's, who's aggregating all this? Is that done well enough? At the more model level, we've got the, um, the system architects, the system developers, we've got the system operators. And again, part of the risk and governance story is just how, how are these people being used? What conversations are they having with themselves? And also how are they having you know, with, with the technology to make the system really, really work well. Okay, so these are some of the kind of more open questions we're getting, but with risk maturity, what we have to see is that level of integration through the system. And that will depend on culture. We won't talk about culture right now, but of course we can if, if that's helpful. Um, but risk maturity and risk culture go hand in hand. It's how willing are people to, to adapt to these things, accept the set the risks, understand the risks, act on them, and so on, and so on. And we know from the general risk literature that people underestimate risks and sometimes overestimate risks, depending on kind of wildly varying contexts. So how do we make sure that people are, are really spot on with all this? Would be super important. Um, all right, so listen, I just, I must just finish for this afternoon. Um, maybe a few, just a few questions for discussion. Uh, the aggregate view of risk is, is very important, particularly in, a, in an organization as, as wide and diverse as, as, um, as BT. Second issue, what blueprints do we need for design and operation? Um, and also, of course, what would be very helpful for us researching this now, your, your sense of what are the first steps here? Um, what, are the, what other issues should we be following? What, what, what's missing from the picture? Um, what can we learn from financial services and construction and other 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 and logistics and other other places? Um, anything like that, anything to, to guide us in our in sort of final year and a bit of the research would be really, really, really welcome. Um, and last thing, we're going to be in room four. So my colleagues uh, Eleanor and Pradeep and myself will be in room four. It's a joint session uh, in room four. So we're sharing that session with our great colleagues at, um, at Bristol. So first half of that session will be will be um, uh, will be us, and we'll be looking at the two cases. One is uh, from Barclays, and one is from a large construction firm involved in model risk and, and other things. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that there. We'll look at look at cultural dynamics and model governance and challenges and risk and automation and all the things we've just done more generically here. Um, the second, then, then there'll be a Q and A uh, in the first half. Um, in the second half, um, our colleagues from Bristol will talk about their experience of using digital twin model development and risk. Um, it's a really fantastic case and the, the whole open RAN uh, story as well. Um, and then, uh, so that's the kind of first half of that session. And the second half will be repeated for people who want to, you know, obviously drop in from other sessions. So we'll give, give a chance to have, um, uh, so people can come in and, and hear it fresh. That's the plan. Um, I, I, I must stop now. Um, I hope that was clear. Um, 
really look forward to seeing you uh, in the afternoon session. Thank you so much for listening and um, I'll hand back to Paul.